Welcome back to the table, everyone. I had to put the camera a little bit higher up for me to, to reach in order to show this box. This is CV by Yaquinto Games. I hope that's how you pronounce it, um, Yaquinto. And the box, I'm going to say, is just a slightly different box size than some of the other games I've picked up recently to look at. Um, but this is this is great. I got done with Tokyo Express. I took Tokyo Express back to my buddy and I asked him, hey, you know, what what game should I unbox next and show folks? And we looked at his collection and we, we decided on this one to, to show. He's got more. But I'm, I'm happy to show this one because he does have what I would call the trifecta of the flat top games. So first he's got flat top, the battle line edition, which I will unbox and show. Then he's got second up, which is CV. So this one came maybe one or two years after Flat Top did by Battle Line, and it's supposed to be refined. Although I haven't really read exactly what the refinement was. Then he's got Flat Top by Avalon Hill, which then came out like a couple years later. And I guess someone could argue that that's an even more refined system. So this is the middle of the the series. Uh, different publishers, so one could argue it was part of a series, but they come from that, that pedigree line. So that's CV, so a game of the Battle of Midway. So Flat Top, yeah, Flat Top is Midway as well. So I think this is just another another variant. Or maybe it's Coral Sea, I don't know. I'll find out when I grab his Flat Top box exactly where that covers. So we'll take a look here. Now he does have some box damage, so I'm trying to be careful with his box. And I was like, wow, this is black and white. There's no fancy cover color picture of the the map boards or the the game pieces or anything like that. And I was just talking to my friend and he was like, well, yeah, the as you go back in time, the game designs were, you know, completely different as far as the eye candy and whatnot, design philosophies. And so there's not a lot of pretty on some of these games. Um, so the box was showing me that. So here, the scale is 20 miles per hex, one hour per turn, individual ships, three plane elements, and 40 to 60 man ground formations. Number of players, two to four. And I'm not going to play this one. This is just to show it off. I, I liked Tokyo Express because that was solitaire play. Like that was designed as a solo play experience. I would like to get Carrier. Uh, but that's a little pricey on the eBay, so my friend recommended that I just hold off and get the the redo since uh, John Southerd is making a carrier Philippine Sea game from Compass Games. Um, yeah, my friend was like, yeah, just save your money. I don't know, I still might break the mold and pick up um, Carrier, the first one. But anyway, we're talking about CV. Stream of Consciousness, that's me. Anywho. Right down here, complexity. Level 4. This game is designed for experienced players and is very complex and detailed in its treatment. Recommended for veteran players with a high interest in the subject matter. Yeah, um, I could believe that. I think that if you got two people invested in this, it's probably not as complicated. I was reading through some of the rules and there's a lot of chrome in there. But, yeah, I, I think... I think it is a complex game, but uh, I don't think it's unplayable kind of complex. But I'll show you some of the interesting things in here I found. All right, so first is the, the box cover. So we'll just set that aside. And the map. So the maps are an interesting card stock. Now, when I was looking at this battle line, that had a really nice mounted maps. And then flat top was paper map, and then this is a cardstock map. Not a lot of pretty to it at all, but it does have Pearl and Hermes Reef. There's Midway right there. Kure, the Ocean Island. A little bit of age coloring there. And we'll fold it up. So there's a lot of ocean to play here. And I I don't know if these both unfolded would fit in my poster board, I mean they might, but um, Lysiansky, Laysen, 
Yeah, they have here the International Date Line, Latitude, Longitude Line, Tropic of Cancer. Um, these are just to kind of give reference to where things fit in the world. But according to the rules, these Latitude, Longitude Lines are just decoration to kind of give you reference to the real world. Have no gameplay mechanics at all. Awesome. So that's map one. Let's see if I can fold this back properly. Yep, got it. Yeah, my buddy unfolded one and we couldn't figure out how it was supposed to fold back, but nailed it. Here's a second map. This has got North Pacific on it. It's also got a latitude longitude line. Let's see here. Ah, there we go. This has got a point record and time record sheet on it, tracker. Uh, not much land mass there, so yeah, definitely battling around midway. Looks like got something spilt on there. I didn't do that, by the way. That wasn't me. So two maps. All right, fantastic. Then I think I figured it out. All right, so maps folded properly. Here is the Japanese, or here are the Japanese holding boxes. So you get a page here. This has got your aircraft boxes, so we can mark aircraft if they're high or low in their formations. Task force and base boxes, so you would stick your ships here in the task force, and you also have the corresponding task force marker until you put them on the map. And then your aircraft, you can mark if they're just landed. And so the idea is these task forces then are going to revolve around a carrier. So you'd have your carrier in here with its escorts. And then you can say, when you start, put your planes in the ready to launch. You can have some refueling and rearming or just landed. And then you can eventually move stuff to a cap. And the game said uh, they're not sure why people would start with just landed or refueling and rearming. Most people are going to start with ready to launch. But you can put your aircraft as you want. And then we've got Submarine Patrol, which is not part of the basic game, but this would be part of the optional, as you move to the advanced rules, there's submarines. So the basics are your task forces and tracking your aircraft. So there's the Japanese holding boxes, still in good shape. Yeah, so from 1979 to 2021, still holding on. And same thing with the American aircraft tracker there. Task, your carrier task force is down here. There's a Johnson, Johnston, Hawaii, oh, Midway. There you go. So you can have your aircraft here. There was a Japanese base it mentioned down here, but only one. Uh, so this has got, there's, they have a base in the Marshalls and one in Wake, and you got one box that covers both of those land bases. But what they were saying is, and I might get this wrong, but the Marshalls only did seaplanes, and then the Wake only had land-based aircraft. So they said they only needed one tracker because if you see the air, you know, if your aircraft are here, the ones that are marked for sea are obviously coming from the Marshalls, and the ones marked as land planes are coming from Wake. Um, so there was the land base, but here they got Hawaii and Midway specifically separated out. So that's cool. There you go. So you've got your American tracker. And this I thought was really, really fascinating. Uh, when I first opened the box, there there were some of these already kind of folded because I think people were playing or they started because I don't see any any tracking. But yeah, you've got these really long pads. They got some markings here, so time. So I know somebody was playing something at some point here, but there's time tracks. Not sure. Um, plain data charts. So this is this is definitely one of your player aids. And then on the back is a small reference sheet for both maps. And this is where you do all your plotted movement as a player. And there was some of these that were free floating, but they weren't really marked up. So I was like, you know, it's hard to say if anybody's actually played much. Or this is just maybe they were starting or pulled them out, trying to get right side up. And this is another reason I don't want to, I mean, you know, if I played, I would try to photocopy these as best as possible because 
I don't want to mark up the originals because I don't think it's going to be very easy to find more of these online. So, anyway, some classic vintage paperwork here for your game. Here's some other player aids. Well, actually, here's, here's the original pad of the air record sheets for the Americans and the hidden plot. So this is like the original pad right here. There's quite a few. It just is, you know, ignorance on my part to take for granted that I just go onto the internet, go to a company's support page and just hit print. And they usually have stuff you can print. But this harkens back to a time where that probably wasn't going to happen. And I don't know, I'll have to see if he's got like an order form in here. But a lot of box games I've seen, classic box games, they have the like catalog with order form to order more data pads. Because there's a lot here, but um, you know, if you and your friend play this a lot, you're going to run out of these trackers. So those are classic. And then we have here air hit tables. So this is the CB game card. There's two of them. They are identical. So there would probably be, you know, one for each player. And you can tell uh, these are probably aged with time. These are probably white at some point. But uh, I don't know, maybe they, maybe they were yellow and it's just faded. But we've got the air hit tables. Air versus midway. There's high bombing, low bombing. Air versus ship. Air versus sub. Your air hit table for modifiers here. Surface hit tables for surface combat. Your combat results table. Ship to ship combat modifiers. Plus two against anchored or dead in the water. Nice. Surface torpedo combat modifiers. So there's combat modifiers. And on the back, observation tables, critical hit tables, ship sizes, night landings. So not too not too much information, but um, looks like everything you pretty much need then is going to be on your plotting sheet and your couple of play aids. So there you go. Run the game from that. And here we have some more original page. So this is Japanese ship record sheet. And then on the back, American ship record sheet. All right. So Japanese record sheet and American record sheet. Hits, ammo, torps. Yep, got to track your torpedoes. And again, an original pad. This one I could easily photocopy. This other one, that's this weird paper length. I don't know if that's some sort of like letter paper length or something. That's going to be a little harder to copy. But this looks more like 8.5 by 11, so I could get those copied if I needed them. All right, so that's some of the paperwork. There might be some more paperwork here. Nope, doesn't look like it. We do have... Okay. Let's let's talk about this real quick. Uh, so the rules said there was two counter traits. I had seen just one. But what it is, there are actually two counter trays. These are a little bit not wanting to separate. Oh, they don't want to come apart. They've been stuck together for th over almost 40 years now. So, yeah, I don't want to bust them getting them apart. But that is, this is something that I didn't even know companies did until I started digging into my buddy's classic games. Not all of them, but so far, um, Tokyo Express had a counter tray, and now this game has two counter trays. In fact, the rule book even has special instructions for handling the counter trays. It says, if you plan on storing the game flat, great. Um, just, you know, put your paperwork and stuff on top of the tray. That way the pieces aren't flying all over the place. And then it says, if you plan on storing this in an upright position, then you might want to tape, um, like, paper... Well, I forget what it said, like a you know, paper bag or something on top of here to create your own cover. And it said use uh, like, um, I forget exactly what it says, like brown, brown paper and cellophane tape as hinges and just make yourself like a lid so you can lay that flat. 
that way your pieces don't all come flying out when you store this in an upright position. So I thought it was very cool. They gave some thought and consideration to counter trays. Now, let's take a zoom in at the counters. And this, this is definitely harking back to my classic game experience. The counters are very plain. Now, I'm not saying that in a bad way, but I definitely have been spoiled by the 30 or so years later as we get into counters where they're full color. These are singular color with a black silhouette. And some of them are just hard to read. Uh, not because they're poorly cut, but because they're small. So I think these are half inch counters. And like that says SS16, I think, for like price for submarine. Uh, it's got a combat values of 1015 which I read and that all means something. Task force counters, but as you can see, just very plain. The aircraft here, Val dive bombers, Kate, at least I think the Val was a dive bomber and I think the Kate was a torpedo plane. Zeros, some Jakes, Judy's, Betty's, Pete. They all sound so friendly, the Japanese do. Who would want to shoot down Pete? Uh, Nell, oh, trying to remember I th this strip here. I don't remember if that meant land-based. This little strip meant if it was like a land-based aircraft. Then you've got, uh, yeah, it's hard to read. It's just small. AV, CAV, I can't read the name. So, yeah, definitely, definitely a, when I was 30 years younger, probably would play this just fine. Looks like some of the Japanese infantry units, submarine periscopes, clouds, formations of aircraft, victory points. So they're all here though, uh, totally and completely unpunched. So that probably answers my question of, was this game played at all? Well, probably not if it's not been unpunched. You're gonna have to unpunch some counters here if you want to play the game. Unpunch? I guess I'd put them back. You're gonna have to punch some counters out if you wanted to play. But uh, yeah, here's, here's some more aircraft, lots of destroyers, got some submarines, your task force counters. When you're loading up your aircraft, I think the Japanese have it. No, I don't see it for the Japanese, but the Americans are going to choose... Let, oh, okay, I do remember this. These blue counters are neutral, anybody can use them. Then this grayish color was the Americans, and then this red is the Japanese. So when you're setting up your aircraft initially, one of the things you have to do is pick, are they loaded up with AP or HE? That way you know what to, uh, to drop on the target. And you got torpedoes, turn marker, probably a day-night tracker, dispersal, some anchors. Not quite sure how those would fit into the game mechanics, but there's the counters. These are... Let's see again. If this was, let's say, 1979, I'm not good at math. We'll just round it up to 1980. 20 years. 2010 would be 30. 2020 is 40. So what is this game? Like, just over 40 years old. Almost as old as me. Crazy. But it's all here. And how lovely. So again, probably not going to play this one. Only because... I know my son wouldn't want to play it. And because of the hidden movement, it is definitely not a solo design game. But I definitely wanted to open that, share what comes in it, a look into the past. So I hope you enjoyed that look back in time at, let me get the lid cover, a look back in time at CV. A Game of the Battle of Midway by Akinto Games. All right, thanks for tuning in, and we'll talk to you another time. Bye. Oh, and quick side note. I completely forgot about the rule book. Oh, my, my son decided to start yelling outside. I don't know if you heard that, but if you heard screaming, I don't know what they're doing. I hope they're alive at the end of this. Anyway, yeah, the rule book. I had taken this out to look at it and then completely forgot to uh, show you this. But yeah, it definitely is feeling the 
40 years of age, I, I feel like I should be wearing archival gloves when, when touching this stuff. And uh, so here's the book. I like the picture they've chosen though. I think that's pretty cool. And 1979. Yeah, and my buddy, he was like, well, just be prepared for some painful reading. I don't think the layout is as bad as he maybe remembered, but he does have some games where the rules look like they were set up on a typewriter and just, you know, someone had to type it all out by hand. This doesn't look too shabby, actually. It is in three columns. It's kind of the small print, you know, fine print, so you're going to gonna have to spend some time reading it but it probably did take them a long time to get a layout like I'm not even gonna kid you I, I have no idea how this stuff was laid out and printed back in 79 to me I imagine it was all some sort of big press where they had to individually set all the yeah I, I don't know uh, I don't know if they had computer processors then and printers that could do all of this but it doesn't look as bad as he first made it sound. I bet if I dig in his collection though, I will find some really horribly typed rule books that look very crude, but this actually looks pretty good. Now there is some complexity, like I was saying. Uh, I think sometimes the fine print and the layout makes it look more complex than it is. The first few pages from what I was reading was just explaining some basic concepts of the game, set up, how to use the holding box charts and that that is as far as I read so that part is easy right but then you've got the plot to the plot map set up and then from there it jumps right into the basic game rules and then it's just from there just uh, maybe what makes it complex I don't see a lot of examples in here and maybe that's what is missing so it's just basically rules 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 um, but again I haven't sat and read all of it yet so there could be some examples thrown in here that helps break it up a little bit but there's definitely no color pictures to help uh, so it is kind of stepping stepping back in time a little bit but after you hit page 16 that's where the rules stop. And then it gets into page 17. So like 16 and a half pages. Page 17, it hits the optional rules going forward. And then once you get near the back is the scenarios. And looks like, uh, well, men, leadership, hints on play. Yeah, so I think it is just right back here. Oh, what does this have? Oh, game reference material. So here's... Scenarios at the back, Japanese force columns. So here's the scenarios. So there's a couple pages worth of scenarios, not much. Then historical summary, again, the historical summaries I need. And this is cool, it's got the, uh, looks like victory fever, the Japanese would call it later, referring to the overconfidence that seized them in the spring of 1942. So this is midway, and then this is breaking it down, looks like June 3rd, June 4th, and then by the hour just about, it's got some notes on things that are happening. So a nice breakdown. Talks about the men, midway itself, the leadership involved, the warships, talks about the different types of planes involved, and then hints on playing it. Uh, so CV duplicates the most important aspects of air and sea warfare at the Battle of Midway. As such, the historically successful tactics are also those which will prove successful in the game. There are numerous possibilities regarding plans and tactics that may be tried, and this section can only provide a few general hints and observations. So, And then some designer notes. Yeah, here we go. Designer notes. As many readers of these rules may be aware, CV is my second game on carrier warfare in World War II. The first, Flat Top, done for Battleline Publications two years ago, covered the better... Oh, covered the battles of the Coral Sea uh, in the Guadalcanal area. CV reflects two more years of research, playtesting, and just plain thinking and arguing about the topic of World War II carrier operations. This game is a result of those efforts and provides a detailed model of the events that led to and caused the decisive Battle of Midway. I hope you find the game as interesting to play as I found it interesting to design. So there you go, that's the pedigree right there. So from flat top, but again, I'd have to look at the pedigree of the um, Avalon Hill flat top to see what what improvements they might have put in there. So 
yeah, very fascinating. I didn't want to forget the rule book, but there is the rule book. Maybe not color examples, but there are some, some sample pictures in here. All right. Well, that would be the last bit that goes back in the box. Thanks again for watching, and we'll see you on the next Classic Game Unboxing.